Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Black Box Training System class. Uh, I'm sorry, the Black Box class for this week. Um, we are very fortunate to have Edward Modla. He is the Executive Director of Investor Education with the Options Industry Council. He is an absolutely amazing instructor. And so enjoy the show, guys. He's going to talk to us about volatility. Ed, it's all yours. Thank you so much for the introduction and the invitation. Good to be back here speaking to your audience. Looking forward to this discussion. Just a brief minute about myself. I got started in the options business uh, in the late 1990s, right from graduation to the trading floors in Chicago and in New York. I worked for a few of the largest options market making firms in the open outcry environment. Felt very fortunate to get down there in the trading pits while they still existed. Um, but then we, of course, transitioned to the electronic environment. I traded independently for a number of years while I was also a futures broker. Uh, but going on seven years now, almost strictly in education, I really enjoy uh, teaching the options product to investors and money managers and financial advisors and anybody that wants to learn about options. Of course, volatility is a very popular topic. It always has been. So looking forward to today's discussion. First, our disclaimer, options are a complex tool, need to be well understood before being used in a live account. And our outline for today, there's gonna to be plenty of basic level education for those who need that, but also uh, plenty that I would say is not basic. So a little bit for everybody today, we'll start out with some definitions of volatility itself, and then the difference between historical and implied volatility. Introduce briefly the concept of vega and what that is. Uh, which is the Greek associated with changes in volatility levels. And this uh, idea of historical implied volatility, one of, what I mean by that, which also will include some analytics or how you might use the number of implied volatility that you see or witness in your trading platform, as well as a few of the more classic strategies that are used by investors or mostly market professionals that are strictly trading based on an analysis of volatility. Before I get to those definitions of historical and implied, let's just take a step back and remind ourselves what volatility is. And it reflects fluctuations in stock prices that uh, do not specify whether those moves are to the upside or the downside. This is just movements, uh, the peaks and the valleys from one starting point to an ending point and does not imply a trend in one direction or the other. If you had two stock prices that started and ended at the same exact point, in between that start and end point, there would be different levels of movement of the stock prices and therefore different volatility levels. A more volatile stock may also finish the time period at the same place as a less volatile stock. By that same measure, you could have another underlying stock that starts where the other two start and finishes the time frame up 1% or 2% or 3% while the other two are unchanged. Um, but depending on the size and the magnitudes of those peaks and valleys, that stock that was not unchanged might have the least level of volatility amongst the three. Volatility reflects fluctuations irrespective of direction. Let's keep that in mind as we think about volatility levels throughout the rest of the discussion today. Starting with historical volatility, it's going to be those three definitions I get to, historical volatility, then we'll get to implied volatility, and then I'll introduce what I call historical implied volatility. Historical volatility is factual. It is specific to stock price movements in the past, what has the stock price done over a certain period of time? Looking backwards, this is observed, it's quantified, it's historical volatility between today, looking backwards at what the stock price movements have done, and then using those price fluctuations to calculate a per, an annualized percentage historical volatility level. Now, this time frame from today to where we start our observations is different between uh, from one investor to the next. You might look at the last 
10 days of stock price movements. You could look at the last 30 days, the last 90 days. Uh, speaking to options investors, I think 30 days comes up most often. It uh, encompasses uh, sort of that medium range time frame. But if you're a short-term trader who's looking for a, a one or two day trade, you might look at the shorter time frame and want to know what's the what's the last 10 days of historical volatility been for the shares to give you an idea of what might be coming up over the next day or two. That time frame completely up to the investor uh, and, and uh, it might be consistent with their trading approach and the strategy that they're trying to employ. I'm going to spend some time here comparing distributions, and this is where we'll start to translate this into the options piece. We have three different stocks here, A, B, and C, with different levels of historical volatility. Remember, that's looking back at what the stock has done. And for the purposes of this conversation here, let's assume we're looking at the past 10 days. You have stock A, 15% over the past 10 days, stock B, 25%, C, at 35%. And as we look at how this breaks down, we have the stock prices on the horizontal axis. This is a $100 average stock price, uh, prices to the upside, prices to the downside. And then this vertical axis here is the number of observations that you would have at a given stock price during the time frame. Uh, with stock A exhibiting the lowest level of volatility, you would have the most observations around the mean for stock A and the most narrow range from top to bottom for stock A. And we'll just compare that to stock C, for example, 35%, the highest of the three would have the lowest number of observations around the mean and the widest top to bottom range. Now let's start to think about options now. This is the past 10 days of stock movements. And if this was all the information you had and you didn't know anything else and you were asked to use a volatility level to price options that expire 10 days from now, how would you do that? So remember, options are more concerned with what's going to happen than what has happened. If this is the only information you had, then certainly you might price options looking forward with an assumed 15% level of volatility, and stock C might be priced at 35% assumed future volatility. Therefore, options on stock C would be higher than stock A. However, we always have more information than just the historical volatility levels. For example, you'll hear me refer to earnings a few times today. Uh, if stock C had earnings over the past 10 days, and the stock was fluctuating rapidly, now it's starting to settle down a bit, maybe that's where that 35% is coming from. The next 10 days might not be expected to see too much share price movement. On the flip side, stock A might have earnings coming up. It's been consolidating at this historical level over the past 10 days, but it's expected to move to a much greater extent because of that earnings announcement. Given that information, you would certainly price options on stock A much higher than stock C with that added piece of information. Now, if you're trying to then further ask, what volatility would you use for stock A? You've seen 15%, earnings is coming up. So how do you figure out what that volatility assumption should be? Uh, well, one thing you can do is look back to previous earnings announcements. Go back as far as you want, one year, three years, five years, and see what has the stock done? What kind of movements have there been? You can also check levels of implied volatility. Looking back, I'm forecasting that historical implied volatility analysis here. Look back to see what did implied volatility levels change from uh, before and after earnings, and that might give you an idea of what level of volatility you can assume or expect over the next 10 days, given some historical reference of what the stock has done based on previous uh, earnings announcements. Uh, where it gets tricky is now, let's think of the example of IPOs who don't have that history. Uh, how do you price options on an IPO when they're about to release their first earnings announcement? And the short answer is it's difficult. It's these types of circumstances 
when you will often see uh, markets get wider, the bid ask spread get wider, and the size being bid and offered shrink because market participants are not sure what to expect. So there's fewer market participants putting in buy and sell orders. You might just have the market maker or the professional who's offering their markets. And this is what I would do on the trading floor if I was unsure about what volatility levels should be. I did my best to insert that level, but I would widen the markets, lower the size, and wait for order flow to come in. If buy orders were coming in and I was selling options one after the other after the other, I was raising my prices. If I was buying options on the, on the flip side because sell orders were coming in, I was lowering my prices. Trying to find that equilibrium. This is what professionals are trying to do. Find that equilibrium level where you're getting buy orders and sell orders, regardless of calls or puts. doesn't matter. Just buy orders for options versus sell orders. You want both of them as a professional market maker. And once you find that level and you get comfortable, the bid-ask spreads start to tighten up more market participants will enter and the size goes back up. This can happen, uh, I'm, I'm describing uh, an earnings with an IPO, but really any time there's uncertainty about where volatility should be for a certain expiration, that's often what happens. Wider markets, lower size, until the market figures it out. And then those uh, bid-ask spreads tighten up and the size comes back. I've referenced a few times the volatility assumption that is used to price options. And that is what implied volatility is. We talked about historical volatility. That's what the stock has done. Implied volatility is unique to options. And it is the volatility assumption at which the option is currently being priced determined by a pricing model or another definition is it's the volatility assumption which justifies a given options price. You could say that this volatility level reflects an, expe an expectation for what the underlying stock volatility is going to be between today and expiration date. Uh, volatility changes are simply a function of a change in the dynamics between supply and demand, bids and offers, buys and sells. That's what drives changes in implied volatility levels. And those buys and sells come from everybody. It's not just the professionals, it's individuals, it's all market participants who are putting bids and offers into the market. They all drive where prices are going to go. And ultimately that drives where implied volatility levels are. Now, certainly in order to buy one contract is not going to have the kind of influence that an order to buy a thousand contracts would have, but it's that cumulative effect of the volume of buys versus the volume of sells that drives prices of options up and down and changes implied volatility levels along with it. That cumulative volume uh, is, is derived from all market participants. You, me, and everybody else contributes to the size of, of the buys and the size of the sells. Now, strap it in here. We're going to spend some time on this slide looking at uh, option premium, and then we'll isolate that volatility component. Uh, the question that I'm going to ultimately um, answer and get to here is, you know, given an unchanged stock price and increasing implied volatility levels, does that mean that options prices are going higher? Just keep that question in mind as I walk through it again. If the stock is not moving and you are tracking implied volatility levels with each passing day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and on, and implied volatility is going up, does that mean that the option price is going higher? And if you're trying to answer that question, the answer is no. And hopefully you'll see as we walk through it uh, how, that, uh, how that can be explained. Option premium in its, in its most simple form is broken up into two pieces. First is intrinsic value. I'm going to pause just to make sure we're on the same page. For those of you who might not be familiar with the term moneyness, uh, options can be characterized 
into one of three categories with respect to their moneyness. In the money, at the money, and out of the money. Those are the three. The way I define those three is from the perspective of the option buyer or the option holder. If the holder of an option owns the right to execute a transaction in shares of stock at a better price than is currently being offered in the open, open market, then the option is considered in the money. If the option holder owns the right to execute a transaction in shares of stock at a worse price than the open market is offering, that is an out of the money option. Let's just think about calls, the holder of a call option with a strike price below where the stock is currently trading has the right to buy shares at a better price. That's an in the money option. For calls, strike prices above the current level of the stock, that's out of the money. Puts work by the same defini definition, but since the owner has the right to sell shares of stock, in the money put options are those with strike prices above where the current market uh, for the shares is trading. Intrinsic value only exists for in the money options. At the money and out of the money options have an intrinsic value of zero. For in the money options, intrinsic value will exist and then it can be further calculated as the distance between the stock price and the strike price. This is very easy to determine. Uh, it's either zero or you can do simple arithmetic to calculate a value for intrinsic value. The other component is extrinsic value, which is commonly called time value. There's a number of variables that affect extrinsic value. This is the days to expiration. This is the volatility assumption, otherwise known as implied volatility. Uh, the current uh, observed risk-free interest rates in the market and any known scheduled dividend payments that might exist between today and expiration. These final two components uh, are known numbers. We know what the risk-free rate is. We know what dividends are expected to be paid. Everybody knows how many days till expiration there are and that number is being reduced, of course, with each passing day. Uh, volatility is that big unknown. And if you were to insert uh, values for all of these uh, inputs, then what you would get uh, as a result is an option premium. And I'm going to just draw that in really quick. As, as these uh, six variables are the inputs <clears throat> into a pricing model, uh, inserting something for all six across will result in an option premium amount. And since you inserted the implied volatility level, this then could be considered uh, a theoretical options value or a hypothetical options value, assuming that your volatility assumption is correct or that you have confidence in that volatility level. Conversely, you can leave implied volatility unsolved, insert the known values of where is the stock, where is the strike, how many days left till expiration, what's the risk-free rate, what's the known dividend, and what's the observed option premium amount, what's the last trade, what's the midpoint, whatever value you want to use to, uh, to input your observed option premium, and then back solve for implied volatility. Remember one of those definitions I just gave, the volatility level that justifies a given options price. And that is often what investors and market participants are doing. Instead of assuming they know the volatility level, they assume the market knows volatility levels best. Let's insert the premium and calculate what volatility level is associated with that option premium amount. Now, I asked the question earlier, um, if the stock price isn't moving and volatility levels are going higher, does that mean higher options prices? And now you probably can see if the stock price isn't moving, we know the strike isn't moving, days to expiration are being reduced. They're getting lower. It's getting a, it's a smaller number with each passing day. Interest rates aren't changing. Dividends aren't changing. If the premium is also not changing, but days to expiration are getting smaller, implied volatility levels have to go higher in order for the math to work. 
And there's a few circumstances where you will see this, it's why I'm pointing it out, where the premium of the option just does not change from one day to the next, from one week to the next, it does not change. And that results in higher implied volatility levels, but not higher options prices, the same options prices, or maybe even slightly reduced. For those of you familiar with, with Greeks, you could have a decay in an option that is less than that uh, of which theta is suggesting. And it's resulting in higher implied vol levels, not because prices of options are going up, maybe because they're staying the same. One circumstance where you will notice that is prior to earnings. Option buyers might be willing to keep their bids in place, anticipating a big move with, uh, with the earnings announcement upcoming. Option sellers may not be aggressive at all, lowering their offers, even though there's less days till expiration because they know an earnings announcement is coming. You will see this commonly where prior to earnings, option values hold their value. Premiums stay relatively the same. Uh, and that results in this gradual increase in implied vol levels leading up to that earnings announcement. And then once earnings is released and the uncertainty uh, has been removed from the market over what that announcement will be, then you will see prices of options come down and implied volatility levels come down right along with it. I'm going to try and draw in one more thing here. And as I do this, just you know, bear with my uh, slight inability to use PowerPoint that well, but I'm going to try to draw in a volatility curve uh, and a volatility skew. And we'll talk about that for just a minute with respect to that dynamic that I just outlined. So here we have, um, implied volatility levels that we're going to plot on the vertical axis here and k is the strike prices uh, across this horizontal axis and i'm identifying that at the money level uh, of, uh, of strike price and let's try to draw in a volatility curve you could uh, plot the implied vol level at each strike price uh, implied vol levels are unique to each strike and you can plot where that level is and then connect the dots. And this is what is known as the volatility curve or volatility skew. And I just drew in the classic shape of volatility skew. Remember these lower strike prices, you're gonna be your put options and the higher strike prices will be your calls. And the reason why this is a classic shape is because while calls, remember the volatility levels are just a function of supply and demand, buyers versus sellers. While calls and puts can be used to speculate Put options are frequently used to protect a position or protect a portfolio. Options are, uh, at its core, a risk management tool. So because there is more demand to buy that protection, uh, that, that greater demand translates into greater option premium amounts, translates into greater implied vol levels. And so you'll see this, this dynamic here of puts being more expensive than their call counterparts. Now this curve, uh, you'll, you'll tend to see it in index options for sure, but when it comes to equities, uh, there's no rule that this curve is going to look like this. In fact, in today's world, I've seen more uh, unique, different looking shapes than ever before. Um, you can have symmetrical looking curves where puts and calls look to be priced fairly equally. You might see that most commonly with uh, commodity underlines whose, uh, whose price might move in, in both directions with an equal amount of velocity. So you've got uh, you've got that dynamic of demand on both sides. You can also see inverted curves. Uh, I think the most classic example for an inverted curve would be if you have an underlying whose price movement is the opposite direction of the overall market. Think about VIX. When the market crashes, the VIX spikes, and when the market rallies, the VIX kind of holds steady. So um, or, or reduces or uh, decreases in value. So you may have that inverted curve where the call options are the ones actually used to protect portfolios in the VIX. All the demand is on the calls. And there's very little demand for very cheap put options in the VIX, you have inverted. Equities can take on any of those shapes. You know, this classic shape, the symmetrical shape, the inverted shape. Um, but let me just take this one step further and get back to our volatility discussion. Uh, as I'm drawing in these strike prices, I'm gonna try to do this uh, as best I can to overlap a bit trying to overlap a little bit here. Let me explain what I'm doing. Uh, we have the lower strikes here and we have our classic looking curve. Now this green line represents the volatility curve with let's say 
two weeks to go until expiration. And the red is the volatility curve with one week left till expiration. You will commonly notice what is known as a steepening of the volatility curve as expiration approaches. And why is that? It goes back to that explanation I gave you before. Investors want to buy cheap puts for protection. Uh, options traders are normally not willing to sell put options for a few pennies or a nickel or a dime. They just don't want to do it. So that nickel option today, as days are, exp uh, days are ticking down, we're getting closer to expiration, 14, 13, 12, on and on, it's still a nickel. Every day, it's still a nickel bid. If that is happening and nothing else is changing, still a nickel bid, days are reducing, implied vol has to go higher to justify that options price, which is not changing with fewer days to expiration, you get the steepening effect. Stock company options certainly will decay, and then you might have a steepening effect on the upside for the same reason. Uh, participants not willing to sell even calls for a nickel or for pennies. And so you get this steepening of the volatility curve as expiration approaches. It's normal, it happens a lot, and it's not because options are getting more expensive with respect to their premium. It's because they're holding their value with less days until expiration. So a lot there, uh, let's, uh, let's keep it moving. And again, just uh, outlining that uh, a comparison here between historical and implied. Historical is looking back at what the stock has done. This is more of a, a summary slide, looking back. Implied is looking forward at what the stock's going to do, but it can be it can be anything, depending on what's what's out here on the calendar, depending on uh, what expectation there might be for an announcement or you know key levels in the stock price. The assumption for how volatile we're going to be in the future, it might resemble historical or it might not. And as I said uh, on the previous slide, each strike price is going to have its own uh, unique uh, implied volatility level. Now, when you compare the two, uh, often you might think, will the implied vol level uh, return or gravitate towards the historical level? Well, it might, uh, but it might not. When you're trading volatility, uh, you might be more concerned or pay more attention to comparing current implied vol levels to previous levels of implied volatility while considering historical volatility. I'm again uh, forecasting what I'm going to get to later, that historical implied uh, term and, and concept. Why well, be concerned about implied vol? Because it does have a major effect on your options premium, specifically the time value or extrinsic value, and it changes constantly. I think for in investors, uh, this, this point here, it can explain option price movement that doesn't look right to you. Stock has moved higher. Why is this call option the same or worth less? Or I bought a put option, the stock uh, got hammered, and I really didn't make much on my put option. Why is that? Um, I'm uh, going to toggle back now uh, with respect to that put option discussion as we were looking at this, this concept here of, of uh, implied vol levels across strike prices. If you own a put option at a low strike price, you speculate on a big move lower on the, uh, uh, on the, the stock and it occurs. Now remember, forget, I'm not gonna put values here. This is just the at the money level. This is where at the money implied vol levels are. These are out of the money implied vol levels. Now try and stick with me on this. If the stock drops, Say uh, it goes from a 100 down to 80. You own the 80 put. And here it is. Stock's at 100. You buy the 80 put option. It sits at this point on the curve. Stock gets crushed and it goes all the way down to 80. Well, now your put option is sitting at the money at this point on the curve. You will have benefited from that move lower, but this is what I call sliding down the curve. As your put option moves closer to at the money, it's actually slowly sliding down this curve. And unless overall volatility is going up, unless this entire green line is moving up, which it might, you might experience 
losses as a put holder just because of this sliding down the curve effect. I've seen it before and some investors are confused by that. When they have a big retraction in share price, they own puts, they don't get the increase in premium they expected. Uh, this is often the culprit. Well, you see the underlying has a steep curve and that option that was out of the money is now close to at the money and its implied vol level is much lower. It's a good reason uh, why uh, to explain why investors who are using options are very conscious of, of implied vol levels when they enter a trade and when they analyze their trade. Not all investors are forming an opinion. Uh, I'll say that as well. If you're thinking, do I need to look at an implied vol level and, and determine is it too high, is it too low? Should I be evaluating this? It's not necessarily the case. Uh, you don't have to. If you are evaluating option premium with respect to time, how much does this cost? Is it too much? Am I getting enough premium if I'm selling this option? If you're just doing that kind of analysis, then you're evaluating implied vol, uh, whether you know it or not. But tracking levels over time can often explain uh, changes in option premium that you otherwise might be confused by. Now, these changes in premium uh, are going to be uh, a bit different with respect to long-term and short-term, and that can be measured as well. But first, let's just take a look as implied volatility increases, this is rather intuitive, then you can say the range of potential future uh, stock prices will widen or it will increase on the top side and on the bottom side. Uh, so both call and put prices will increase as a result of that. The likelihood of both calls and puts uh, being in the money and increasing in value will drive option prices higher. And the opposite is true. If implied volatility levels decrease, that would uh, translate into an expectation for a, a uh, more narrow range of uh, expected future stock prices at expiration, and that is going to shrink both call and put prices. Now, long-term versus short-term, um, if implied vol changes and uh, there's only one, let's say changes by 1%, and there's only one day left until expiration, now that doesn't have a whole, uh, whole lot of an effect on uh, how uh, wide that, that stock price range could be. If you increase vol by 1%, but only for one day, and that's not going to have a huge effect. But if you uh, have an option that expires in a year, and you increase implied vol levels by 1% over the course of an entire year, uh, you've made a, quite a significant change in where that stock might end up a year from now. Uh, so the changes in implied volatility levels will have a greater effect on longer term options than they will on their shorter term counterparts. Uh, now let's, let's look at this number of uh, a little bit of the mathematics. Now, I am certainly not a financial engineer, so I, if you're uh, saving your questions for the end of this presentation, uh, maybe not so much on this concept for me, but um, let's just at least see what this number represents uh, and, and look at uh, some of the math behind it. With the stock currently trading at 80, we're noticing an annualized 30% implied volatility. You're not going to stipulate a strike price here. Sometimes you'll see implied vol levels that encompass uh, an entire expiration date. Maybe it takes an average uh, of calls and puts and it'll, it'll stamp a one implied vol level for an expiration date of options. So let's say we're looking at that here, we see 30% implied volatility. Well, what does that actually mean, 30%? Well, it means that one standard deviation is 30% of the stock price. Or if you do the math with an $80, uh, $80 a share stock price and 30% uh, implied volatility, uh, one standard deviation is $24. Statistically, then, you can expect over the next year a one standard deviation move of $24 in either direction from 80, so do the math, 56 to 104, and you have a probability of being within that range. It looks like a pretty wide range, and it gets even wider, two standard deviations, three standard deviations, Sometimes these numbers are just too wide to be useful for an option investor. Or uh, if you want to start here and then take some percentage of this, maybe you, you reduce this range by a certain amount. Uh, some investors might use this to help guide them towards the selection of a strike price 
either on the upside or the downside. But this, this is the math. Um, there is something else known as the rule of 16, which market participants are often using. Uh, and again, not being, not being a math major, uh, I do know that volatility is, the, is a function of uh, the square root of time rather than time itself. So there are pretty, pretty standard to consider there to be 252 trading days in a year. If you take the square root of 252, you get roughly 16, very, very close to 16. And what you can then do with that number is take an implied volatility level and divide it by 16. And the result is the expected average daily change in the stock price between today and expiration. In other words, if this, let's say this level was 32% implied volatility, 32 divided by 16, and that means that that implied vol level is suggesting an average, a daily average change in the share price of 2%. If implied vol is 48% divided by 16, that is suggesting a 3% average daily move. Remember, that's an average daily move. Does, of course, doesn't mean it's moving that much every single day. It's an average daily move. And you can potentially do that quick math and form an opinion on whether or not you think that level is fair, justified, too high, too low. And what that can help some investors do is possibly decide between uh, buy strategies and sell strategies if they're doing some form of analytics on the volatility level. Uh, now, I said you can measure uh, the actual move uh, as implied vol changes. You can you know, maybe get a sense of how that's going to affect the options price. That is um, calculated or forecasted by a Greek known as Vega. Vega is the option value's sensitivity to changes in implied volatility with a 1% change in implied volatility uh, expressed in decimal form, how much might this option value change uh, all else remaining equal? It does represent a cash amount and this key factor, all of the pricing factors remaining constant. Uh, the greatest effect of changes in implied volatility are gonna be for your at the money options, which have the most amount of time value and your longer term options, which also have the greatest amount of time value. As far as correlation, we outlined this a bit earlier, just to reiterate, calls and puts both positively correlated with Vega. You know, this means if you're buying options, if you're a holder of options, you are known to have a long Vega position because the holder of an option is going to benefit from increases in volatility levels increase in vol and that positive correlation is going to positively affect your account, your long Vega. If you are a seller of options, you are uh, said to have a position that is short Vega because the effect on your position from a P&L perspective is the inverse of changes in implied volatility. Uh, so that's uh, how it works from a position perspective um, if you don't have an opinion on implied vol as you enter trade, again, uh, many uh, market participants I speak to are not forming that, but there are ways to do it. And that's what I want to get into, uh, into next. Historical implied. Now, for starters, uh, do not confuse this with historical levels of past stock prices. That's not what we're talking about here. This is historical levels of implied volatility itself, comparing historic levels of implied volatility to current levels. If you do this, you might be able to make sense or scrutinize current levels of implied vol and how they compare to past levels of implied vol and then form an opinion. Is implied vol today higher? then it has been traditionally? If so, why? Will it gravitate towards its long-term average? When might it gravitate towards its long-term average? Or is for some reason a new normal level in the short term being established in implied vol levels? Uh, this is what some market professionals who are trading volatility 
will be trying to do. If implied vol is low, you might be looking to buy options, uh, expecting implied vol levels to increase. But that scrutiny needs to be there. Why are they low? Are they going to stay that way? Or will they revert or gravitate towards their long-term mean? This sounds a little capital intensive and might be difficult to accomplish, but you might be able to find some metrics out there somewhere, someplace that can help you with that. I'll just briefly address a few of them. There is a concept known as eyeball rank, and then I'll separately define eyeball percentile as possible ways to have some of the work done for you. Eyeball rank has three observations. It compares the current level of implied volatility to a range, a top and a bottom over a defined time frame. That's usually one year. If over that range, implied vol has been as low as 20% and as high as 60%, IVOL rank tries to establish where is the current level within this range. If it's 20%, it's going to be zero. If it's 60%, it's going to be 100. It's sitting at 40 in our example. It's right in the middle. So as a percentage within the range, 40% splitting the middle will leave you with an eyeball rank of 50%. Hope that made sense. And again, if it was all the way at the bottom of the range, if the time frame shown is one year, an eyeball rank of 0% means the current level is the lowest of the year. It's sitting all the way at the bottom. Nothing has been below today's level if the eyeball rank is zero. And if it's 100%, it means implied vol is at its highest level that it's been throughout the year. Three observations comparing the current level to a range. Now keep in mind, since there's only three observations, one of the limitations of eyeball rank is if you get a very short-term spike to the upside. You can have, in theory, uh, implied vol levels sitting at 20% all year long. And for whatever reason, on one day, you get a spike to 60, and then it's back down to 20. And if uh, vol pops to 40%, you're still going to get this 50% number, even though it's been at 20 for 90 plus percent of the time. That's one limitation of eyeball rank is that three observations are all that's included in the math, but could be useful to some investors, possibly in conjunction with percentile which does include all of the observations within the time, uh, within the time frame. Eyeball percentile is the percentage of days that eyeball has been lower than the current level. If you see the percentile is 60%, it means previous levels of implied volatility have been below the current level 60% of the time. This encompasses all of the observations and gives you a more holistic view, not to say it's better, it's just different, a more holistic view of the current level as compared to all of the observations in the time period uh, previous to it. Uh, so there's a couple of things that might be out there for you to look at that might be helpful. Eyeball rank, of course, you can, you can do this rather, uh, well, possibly rather easily yourself if you're trying to scrutinize a particular investment with just the three numbers to look at. Uh, you can probably craft something yourself or observe it yourself. Eyeball percentile, a bit more complicated. Uh, but there's a few things that are out there to help uh, drive this analysis. If you wanted to do that, if you wanted to include an analysis of implied vol as you're trying to decide between buy and sell strategies. Otherwise, like I said, many investors will otherwise just scrutinize the premium itself and get a feel based on their own risk tolerance, what they're trying to accomplish. Is this premium, if they're a buyer, is it too much? Am I paying too much? Does it look cheap to me because of my, uh, when, when compared to my market opinion? If you're a seller of options doing the same thing, how much time is there? What kind of obligation am I taking here? Am I getting enough premium to justify that? Now that's a, an indirect way of doing a very loose uh, implied volatility analysis, judging the option premium, but just not doing so in a sophisticated way like this. Now let's just get into a little bit on the strategies that are most, uh, most commonly used for those volatility traders. And it really comes down to two strategies that are, um, let's say, close cousins of each other and uh, resemble each other just a little bit. Uh, for a period of my career, I was working on a trading desk that was trading volatility is all we did. 
was we compared, uh, we did that historical volatility, historical implied volatility analysis. We made decisions and then we were buying when we thought implied vol was low and we were selling when we thought implied vol was high. Every single trade we were doing were straddles, specifically at the money straddles. When I wanted to execute a trade, I was calling the trading floor and I was quoting the at the money straddle. If I was a buyer, I was buying it. And if I was a seller, I was selling it because it's the pure volatility trade, not biased in direction because it involves both, both calls and puts. If the stock is at 87 half, we're gonna stick with that because at the money straddle is really uh, the most common way to trade these. Stock 87 and a half, you're buying the call, you're buying the put at that level, paying premium on both. And now you have uh, your risk profile here, but really what you're looking for is not necessarily the stock price movement, although it could work in your favor if it goes in one direction, but movement. You're looking for movement and an increase in volatility between today and expiration that's gonna help drive this premium higher. And you're looking for that premium to increase to offset any losses you might endure due to uh, time decay of your options. Uh, now, if you're a seller, of course, and I don't have a graph here for it, but a seller, you're going to flip this around. If you're a seller of a straddle, you have the opposite looking PL graph, which has a lawful lot of risk as both options are uncovered. So if you're thinking selling straddles, is actually a much more common strategy than selling straddles, and that would be your. Uh, iron butterfly strategy, selling an at the money straddle and then buying options on either end to protect it. Uh, so straddles uh, from the buy and sell side again here, most classic, just buy a straddle, buy an at the money straddle, looking for implied vol to increase and selling volatility um, is mostly done, at least from the, uh, not, well, the professionals can certainly sell naked options. They will certainly do that. But from uh, market participant, more of an individual's perspective. If you're looking to sell volatility, you know, having that risk on both sides can be too much to bear. So buying a call and buying a put on either side and then having that iron butterfly. That's what sellers are often doing there. Uh, one of the things about straddles you might hear is uh, economists or market analysts who are, uh, are suggesting that earnings announcements upcoming and the options market is predicting or pricing in a certain move in the stock price. Uh, you might hear that a lot uh, during earnings season. And, and it's most likely they're looking at these straddles and they're looking, if the stock was at 87 half, it's Monday, the earnings announcement is Thursday. These options expire on Friday. You know, for a binary event, they're looking at the options that expire right after that binary event and they might say the options market is expecting a $4 move in the stock price based off of this earnings announcement. And then you can further do the math from there, whatever, uh, whatever percent move that would be, something up over 4%. And then you can say that the options market is pricing in greater than a 4% move in the share price based off of this earnings announcement. And then as an investor, you can decide, is that too much? Is that too little? Is it just about right? you sit it out or do you make a trade? Now the sister uh, strategy that I mentioned is to the straddle is the strangle. And it uh, involves buying a call, buying a put, just like the straddle does, but splitting the strike prices into two. So now you have the out of the money 90 strike call, you have the out of the money 85 strike put, you again paid for both. And you have um, a break even point here of the stock fluctuating in either direction outside the range but since you own two options, the volatility trader is looking for implied volatility to increase and to have the value of their options increase along with it to a greater extent than they would lose in the natural time decay of their options. Again, looking at the flip side, because this is the buyer, this is the holder who's purchasing volatility. If you wanted to sell volatility and have it look like a strangle, Think about how that would look. You're selling these options, but again, that massive risk, professionals are okay with that, but individuals don't like that massive risk. So sell a call, sell a put, and then reach down lower, buy a put for protection, buy a call for protection. If you can visualize what I just did there, that is the iron condor strategy, which is very popular for options sellers who don't wanna take on the significant risk associated with selling unprotected options on either side. Those are the classic 
strategies involved when someone is trading volatility. And if you do trade iron flies, iron condors, you do straddles and strangles, but you haven't incorporated this mathematical implied vol analysis, but you are looking at premiums and you are thinking about, is this expensive? Is it cheap? You really are trading volatility. You're analyzing volatility. It just might not put it into those terms. We got a little time left. I did uh, save some time, fortunately, as I'll, I'll put up our contact info very quickly. If you're interested in more free, we don't sell anything. This education we provide is free. We do webinars like this every month. Uh, I am actually speaking next week uh, on the iron condor strategy for one of our webinars. You can sign up for that on our website, find past uh, information that we've got, and you can contact our team, the team that I manage at the Investor Education at OCC here. Here's our email, send us an email. We can't tell you what trade to do or how to manage it, but if you have educational type questions, the team that I manage is full of former traders and brokers in the options space. We can help you out with your educational type questions. So we'll make use of that email. And with uh, nine minutes or so left, if there are questions, I will be glad to tackle those if they are there. Thank you so much, Edward. Um, guys, if you have questions, please ask them and go to webinar. Um, Teresa will be grabbing any questions that have already been asked through Discord. Um, there are a couple here. One question from Joe, why consider historical, vol historical volatility at all since A, it has no bearing on IV and B, IV is the only metric valid for future options value? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's actually a fair point. Um, I, I didn't explicitly say to ignore it. I, I, don't know if some investors might feel like they want to ignore it, kind of to each their own. Um, historical vol might have its place as a reference. You know, what has the stock been doing and what is implied vol suggesting that it's going to do? And is there a deviation there? Now, I, I did say that what's most important is comparing implied vol to itself, but you might decide Hey, look, those levels are just off. I think the observed future stock price movement is going to resemble what the stock has done. This implied level is not right, and you may form an opinion on that. So it could be useful there. The other more uh, unique, less frequent circumstance is when you do have uh, options on uh, underlyings that maybe just started to trade options. Uh, but may have uh, a history of trading shares. You could have a wealth of, of um, information on historical volatility on the shares, but not much information on implied volatility for options. That does happen sometimes. So yeah, fair point. Uh, use historical as you wish. Take it for what it's worth. Um, but you could incorporate it somehow if you want to to judge uh, whether or not you think the future volatility of the stock is going to resemble what's implied through the options or what is suggested factually through historical. But good question. All right. Uh, is there a website where they can find historical volatility and implied volatility? Well, uh, so the OCC's website, uh, which uh, you can see here, optionseducation.org, we do have um, some snapshots there. Uh, it's in a, a tools section on our website. Uh, if you have trouble navigating that, just send a, an email there to where you see options at the OCC.com and our team will, will get you to it. Um, we don't have robust information in that manner, um, but we certainly do. You can type in a symbol and you can get snapshots. I think we have a couple of different choices of you know, 10 day, 30 day, and, and maybe 60 day uh, historical volatility levels and what the implieds are uh, our numbers will actually take the averages, as I suggested earlier, averages across puts, averages across calls, com uh, compute those unique implied vol levels, and I think we have a total average overall uh, for, for that underlying. So yeah, our website's got a bit of that information, and if it's not enough, if you're looking for more, uh, maybe uh, our team of instructors and market professionals might have an idea for you. So if you're looking for more than what we've got on our website, send an email to the team and maybe we can point you in a different direction. Okay, next question. When selling put credit spreads, what percent of IV should be taken into consideration? Well, it's, it's difficult for me to say what percent of IV to be looking for uh, when you're selling spreads um, be, because it really, it depends on the underlying itself, your impression of what's been going on, what the future outlook is, 
if you look at a certain eyeball level for one trade, it might be high for one particular ticker symbol or low for another. It might be high or low when you consider current market environment versus what's what's been going on. It's really hard to say with any specificity what implied vol levels you might be looking for in a generic sense. Uh, so I just have to answer it that way that you have to include an analysis that looks at that particular underlying and then form an opinion there. You know, one of the advantages that we had on the trading floor, for example, was we traded options on a particular stock every single day for years. So we knew when implied vol was a little bit jacked high or when it was a little bit depressed. Uh, investors might not have that luxury unless you're familiar with a particular stock or you have analytical tools that can do that for you. Um, but uh, unfortunately, when it comes to picking eyeball levels, it really is a matter uh, to be judged on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, the next question, um, I'm not sure if, you can, if you're able to answer it in this particular class, but I'll ask it. I'd like to learn more about uh, taking advantage of Ivy Crush after uncertainty, and is selling an iron condor the best strategy for that? Uh, I got most of that, so I want to take advantage of eyeball crush. Was that, I assume, after earnings? Was that what that said? Just after any event, sorry. After, after any event, okay, sure. So just taking advantage of eyeball crush. Well, um, the, the iron condor is one of your choices, certainly. You know, selling options or, or being a net seller would be the way to try and capitalize on an eyeball crush. If you're selling an iron condor, uh, that is certainly going to be a bit enhanced because you have a risk in either direction. Uh, if there's a binary event, you might think there's more risk in one direction or the other and choose to sell one of those vertical spreads, but not both. When you sell an iron condor, you get more premium, but now you are taking risk in both directions. So you can do a put vertical credit spread. You can do a call credit spread. You can sell an iron uh, butterfly, as I suggested, selling a straddle. Um, and then buying a strangle outside of that, you can do an iron condor. I can't, I can never really say anything's the best because again, options work as advertised. And in some situations, one of those verticals is gonna work out better than the iron condor would. In some situations, the iron fly is gonna work better than the iron condor. So I can't say what's the best, but I can say that the iron condor would be consistent with your market outlook that is going to say, suggest vol will get crushed and and this is the key part, and the movement in the stock as a result of that binary event is not going to be so large that your loss associated with that stock move is greater than the gain you will achieve from the vol crush. You have to keep that in mind. It's a major part of the puzzle. Remember, there's a buyer on that side who's willing to pay, who knows the vol crush is coming. Why would they bother buying that strategy? It's because they might believe the move in the stock is going to be far greater than the market is suggesting, and they're gonna be the ones that make money. So just keep that in mind. But yes, given a, an assumption that you think a vol crush is coming, and you're not concerned about that large move in the share price, an iron condor is very consistent with that market outlook. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Teresa, do you have any questions from this court that we need to catch before I don't we wrap up? No. Okay, well, let's go ahead then and get wrapped up, guys. Thank you so much for joining us, Edward, again. Um, as always, you are amazing. Thank you for teaching us today. And um, guys, if you have any questions, you can always check out optionseducation.org. You can email the investor education team at options at bocc.com. If you have questions for your moderators, uh, we are in Discord, and you can reach us there. Um, other than that, everyone have a great night, and we will see you all later. Take care. Bye. Thanks again. Bye, all. Thank you, Edward. Thank you.